everyone. Welcome to Third Shot Podcast. We've got another great episode in store for you. But before we get into it, please go to our social media. You can find us on Instagram and Facebook at Third Shot Podcast. You can find us on X at Third Shot Pod. You can also watch us on YouTube at Third Shot Podcast. And if a website is more your speed, we've got one of those too. So thirdshotpodcast.com and you can catch up on all of our episodes from the past and you'll be caught up to speed. So let's grab our drinks. We'll do a little toast to Third Shot Podcast. Cheers. How many times can I say that? Coffee today. One I don't day. know. It's a drink. <laughs> it is a drinking game. Every time we say third shot, take a shot. You got a drink. <laughs> I'm just looking at the the amount of third shots. You've got it on your shirt. You've got it behind you, Greg. Like yeah. it's it's in like three different spots behind Greg there. Or, well, yes. visualized at least in one there. So <laughs> it's yeah. everywhere. Third shot. Go to YouTube to see all the references. There you go. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> That's the only reason. Just 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 for the background. Exactly. <laughs> How have you been? Oh. Uh, well, I'm drinking uh, as you can tell. The largest cup of coffee in the world this this can like hide my head um <laughs> it's we're, we're entering you know the, the 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 next sports season here right like oh. it's it's time yeah it's like uh, you've you've got uh you've got meets you've got trainings you've got early stuff late stuff and uh yeah it, it's 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 another busy par- parental year of shuttling around and <laughs> going to different spots and the emotional up and ups and downs of uh, of sports, it's just about to begin for me. Yeah, I mean, how do you balance it? Because obviously, you have a full time job. You, we do two podcasts together. Um, you are a parent, husband, and you have to deal—not deal, but you, you get the luxury of you know doing the sports and being a a, a parental dad uh, to us, an athlete. How do you balance all that? You know, I, I was just talking about this um, uh, yesterday, and actually, it's funny. So I'm, I'm actually working on yet another podcast with uh, with someone. I'm just going to be the producer, just behind the scenes. But I was on the first episode to do some interviews, and we were, and you know, it's it's just about you know how like we were talking about how busy life is and how yeah. you know many things that you have to juggle, and then you become a parent, and it's like whoa, you know, like. So many of those things that I was juggling before don't really matter, but you know, I still got to juggle the job. I still got to juggle you know, all these other things. Yeah. So it's it's not it's not easy. I mean, it's it's a uh, it's a uh, there's a lot going on, and and I don't know. I just I just try to do my best to not feel bad <laughs> you know, about not doing certain things because I mean, you know, some things got to stop, right? You know, it's like. I mean, for instance, the podcast, I mean, there's days where like right now I've, I've got, I've got one of ours to edit that I haven't because other stuff got in the way, you know, the, the family stuff and, and, you know, whatever, but it's like, I can't feel bad about it. (laughs) I just have to, just have to acknowledge and move on and just know like, Hey, doing, doing the best I can here. Um, you had, I I only have, I have one kid in sports. You you had two, Two. (laughs) right? Like, especially with the dancing stuff, like. How was the juggling all that? The dancers, yeah, yeah. You know, it's it's interesting with me because before I had kids, like I, you know, I was an athlete my whole life. I kind of saw myself being that involved dad to teach my kids how to play sports and stuff like that. And all the sports that I played, well, none of them included dance. So. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> So, you know, from uh, from a dad's point of view, I couldn't help with dance, like, you know, technique or anything like that. Like I was hoping to help in baseball or whatever. Right. So it was more emotional support um, and obviously driving. But, you know, (laughs) it's, it's more emotional support and like, you know, there's good, good competitions, bad competitions, good practices, bad practices good coaches, bad coaches. Right. And as a yeah. parent, you just try to be there to help them through all of that. Yeah. Get, get through the, up, the ups and downs. What yeah. I, what I want to know is cause now, you know, I mean, I've got two years left of, of my son being in, in sports in high school, then he's off to college and I feel like it's a different 
Because it's like I got to figure out stuff to do for two years. Because I'm gonna, I feel like I'm gonna have so much extra time. <laughs> oh, I'll fill that time, Russ. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> That's why Uncle picked up pickleball. <laughs> That's right. Right. Yeah. No, yeah. you know the I mean, timing was perfect, Bridgie. That when you introduced pickleball to me, because it was right when. I was empty nesting for the first time and it was, I did need that something to fill that void. Good. So thank you. Yeah, of that. course. So well, let me ask you too, because I'm not a parent yet. Um, what w is like the biggest advice that you would give to parents? Um, maybe they already have children, but their children are just getting into sports. Um, or maybe they're planning to have kids, but what's the biggest advice that you could give them on how to balance having a kid in sports and then also maintaining all of the hundred plus other to-do list items that you both have? That's a, it's a rough one. Uh, I mean, it's, it's, it's very, it's, I would say it's, you know, it's totally situational based on what, you know, whatever they can do, whatever, you know, but the, I think the, the, the big advice is uh if you if you have the time volunteer if you have the the money donate and you know if you if you don't have either at least support the, the like the team in some way not just not just your kid but the team in some way you know drive around or do do something just anything you can to uh to do like to to be there and when you're there don't forget the fun like yeah. We're all there just to have fun. The kids should be having fun with this, even though, you know, it's a it's a competition, right? Whether it's it's dance or, you know, running the mile or, you know, soccer or whatever or or pickleball, which is now in some high schools. Yeah. Uh, don't forget the fun, you know, I mean, and that's what what's interesting about this show is we talk so much about the fun and the community and all of that. If you can bring that aspect from you know that we talk about on this show into the the kids sports it's so much better i've always just tried to have fun and i'm always disappointed with you know there's some parents that just don't you know they just they just uh the pressure's on and they've oh they can't believe they missed that and uh, i'm like it's a kid dude <laughs> you know like just have fun like he is having a great time out there or she's having a great time out there let let them have fun you know I think all three of us have seen parents that take the fun out of sports. Like yeah. literally they take the fun out. Not only, you know, I mean, it's just awful sometimes the, the amount of pressure that some parents put on their kids. I love what you were saying about the advice that you're giving Russ. Um, my, my uh, practical advice, if possible, get a job that you can work from home. <laughs> <laughs> and you could have a flexible yeah. schedule because there are so many things that come up where you want to be there for your kid. And if you're working a traditional eight to five, eight to six job where you have to go and commute somewhere, a lot of times you just don't have the opportunity to be at the practice or to help drive uh, the team somewhere or any of those types of things. And some of the, you know, talking about fun, some of the best times were in the car driving the kids to a match or home from a match or to a practice and just uh, hearing what yeah. they're talking about. Oh, my mm -hmm. gosh. I love I love just eavesdropping into the conversations of what's going on with the team and, you know, all, all the gossip and all the behind the scenes stuff. Oh, my gosh. Right. It's hilarious. It is. The driving is funny it's like no matter what it is whether you know sports driving kids to girl scouts or driving kids to you know the theater or whatever <laughs> take that opportunity because oh man they're yeah. hilarious it is so much fun back there well bridgie for you you were an athlete your whole life what did you appreciate about your parents and how they supported you that's a great question. Everything. I think that I was so fortunate because both of them made sure that they set aside time to be there, um, especially because I was in competitive sports, too. So like looking back now, it's like, whoa, they gave up so much of their free time just to make sure that I was there and I was supported at, you know, with softball, soccer, whatever it was. But um, 
my dad, I think, because he, he worked nights, you know, his yeah. schedule was so crazy. And then he would stay up and go to my games. And then my mom would be rushing from work to come and take us to soccer. And we had our carpools too. So there were plenty of times where we had those fun moments in the car, either like driving all the way down to a tournament in Southern California or just like the day-to-day -day practices. But yeah, lots of involved parents. And it's so great to see that. Did mm -hmm. you see some bad parents on some of your teams that you're like, oh, my gosh, I, I'm so happy that my parents aren't like that? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, well, not, I wouldn't say bad. I think they just had a different stance on um, how they wanted to parent slash coach their kid through um, the sport. So, you know, there was some that was really competitive and would like manage what the child was like ordering and eating at dinners too because they wanted mm. to make sure that their their nutrition was there as well i mean we're like in middle school and high school so that was a little bit like okay i'm glad my parent isn't like that because i i wouldn't want it <laughs> um and then there was some where it was like i knew that their parent wanted to be there but it like financially like they yeah. just couldn't afford to not be at work so yeah i mean that's, that's the thing yeah i mean it's it's not easy right? That, that's the thing. Parenting it's isn't easy. Uh, sometimes I said, hey, practical, you know, hey, get a job from home. Well, yeah, like it's easy to find a job you work from <laughs> home or it's easy that you can have a flexible yeah. schedule. It's, it's not. And, and we all get that. But um, it is a commitment and it's something that, you know, parents, you know, love, right? That's the best thing is like you, the love for your child comes through in the support. Um you know, of, of their passions or whatever their interests are. And a lot of times that's sports. Sometimes it's arts, you know, sometimes it's other things. So whatever it is, just be there and love them. Exactly. Totally. Yeah, totally. Wow. This, this was such a, I, I feel like we should all hug, you know, <laughs> Aww, air hug. <laughs> is there, is there a such thing as a podcast hug? I don't know. I don't Where's know. We got to invent that. We okay. Make that <laughs> we, need, we need a little... <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> we definitely need some big virtual bad. hugs. Yeah, it's so 2020. Um, <laughs> uh, so I totally I, I I went off on a on a on a long tangent there, but I guess the tangent sort of works with our guest today, huh? It does. It does. We're gonna have pickleball Bryant on. He is a pickleball coach, but there's a lot more to his story, including parenting. So I uh, can't wait to bring uh, Bryant on. And uh, before we bring him, this gives everybody an opportunity to go on to our social media, which is uh, what third shot. How do I not even think of third shot? There's all over us right now on the screen <laughs> and everywhere. Third shot <laughs> podcast. Uh, go to our website. Go on to our Instagram, our Facebook. Please keep continuing to give us feedback on how they are enjoying the show um go on to x third shot pod and we promise we're just going to keep on creating content for everybody so on that note let's bring on pickleball bryant welcome bryant to third shot podcast how you doing i am well uncle greg thanks for having me good to see you bridgie how are we doing today we're doing fantastic and thank yeah. you again for joining us um as we kind of prepped you we do have our tradition here so before we jump into the questions we want to do a little toast to you bryant and all of the wonderful things you're doing in the pickleball community Which, likewise cheers to you yeah, guys as well cheers, cheers to it all mm. Mm -hmm. good morning good start, good start. Yeah. let's go good start for the day <laughs> Oh. So we have heard a little bit of your background before, but for our listeners, can you share what your sports background was like before you actually got into pickleball? Yes. Um, so first sport was actually baseball. Started baseball when I was a kiddo, like six years old, loved baseball. Um, and then when I was about eight years old, my, my folks got me a tennis racket and my mom loved and adored Andre Agassi. So I had a tennis racket when I was eight years old and I grew up in, in the North in Ohio. So there's basements. Um, and I remember once I got that racket, once I got home from school, I'd go to the basement and I'd hit aimlessly for hours, just, uh, 
breaking light bulbs because you know it wasn't a pretty <laughs> basement and crashing everything but i would just kept on um hitting this tennis ball and my parents uh soon thereafter were like okay maybe we should like you know get him some of the basics down get him some lessons and one thing led to another i uh after about a year stopped playing baseball went all in on tennis they were incredibly supportive like so many tennis you know parents are for kids that show uh passion for it and have some potential in terms of just like the tournament support um coaching etc and so i was all in on tennis probably from like the age of 10 uh until college and you were highly ranked as a junior player yes i my glory days were before college um i i and it wasn't necessarily a bad uh college career by any means um i just wish it would have continued at this pace it was in junior tennis i reached uh as high as high as number four in the country uh in 16 i was number eight and 18 so highly recruited um you know coming going into college and uh was homeschooled one of my my junior year specifically because there was so much travel involved with the tournaments i would have missed wow. so much school. so yeah like i mean growing up in a very small town in ohio youngstown ohio there's not much there in terms of like being able to hit with other folks. So my, my parents would drive me to Pittsburgh. Um, my coach was in Pittsburgh from the age of 14 till college. So there's more competition there. Some folks would travel in there from the middle States was kind of like that section. Um, and so really, even though I was competing in the Midwest, the middle States is the section that I knew really the most and uh, created the, the most friendships. Um, and so Pittsburgh was almost like my tennis home, even though I lived, grew up in Ohio. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, earlier, uh, Russ and, and Bridgie and I were talking about parenting as an athlete and, yeah. you know, what makes good good supportive parents uh, to athletes, uh, you know, kids growing up and stuff like that. And it sounds like your parents were, um, you're a parent now as well. Yes. How do you envision, you know, parenting a, an athlete or what did you learn from your parents? Gosh, you know, there's there's so many, uh, you know, I don't think there's a crystal ball or just like a black and white answer, like most things, you know, yeah. to like, what's the blueprint to success as a parent teaching your child, you know, um, whether it's tennis, whether it's pickleball, whether it's anything. Um, there's so many positives I took away. The biggest being for my parents is just the the unconditional love and support and just showing up every single day. Like, I think that's the best thing. That's what I took away the most that I'm going to do undoubtedly so for my daughter is just be there and, and support. Um, that's what you need most. And of course, no, nothing, no one's perfect. And so like, there are things that, you know, my mom's not with us here today. Um, she was the best, but she was also incredibly intense. And she would be the first to say like, oh my gosh, I wish I would, you know, dialed it back uh, to some degree in a lot of ways, like after competition, because, she, you know, she would always say, Brian knew your potential, you know, and especially your practice potential. But then when the competition showed up, you know, sometimes that Bryant wasn't always showing up. And so she would really, in, in, in some ways, uh, not in the most constructive way, uh, like try to get the best out of me. And, and I think a lot of tennis folks, if they're being truly honest, have been there or any sport for that matter. You know, they, they're so passionate and they want their child to be so successful um it's just natural for that that heat and frustration to come out um but it's doing the it's having the opposite effect you know for, for for a child and so um i know that you know my for my daughter grace and any other children i may have in the future like i'm just going to be more so just look come for the advice you need but know that like you're not defined by your success on a court um by any means and um more more i mean if you if you take it to a higher level amazing but more so i'm just going to be thrilled that the lessons that they'll gain inside the lines will catapult them to success uh, outside the lines um because it's for an individual sport or doubles you know for pickleball like that's still um essentially like yourself and if anything even more skill sets you're building trying to you know have success in terms of communication, staying positive, building someone else up. I mean, the, 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 the lessons you can learn are, are countless. So, yeah. 
Yeah. yeah. Bridgie, you know, this is not traditional. We usually, you know, just are asking Brian questions. But I do have a question for you because you were such a, a high level athlete growing up and everything. What do you think you learned uh, from being an athlete that transitioned, helped you transition into adulthood and into your career? It's funny you asked me that because when Brian was talking, I was thinking, yes, there's like so many things that young athletes are learning that aren't necessarily just because like, oh, I'm going to be a professional athlete when I grow up and those are the only skills that I'm going to have. But you can apply those. They're so transferable. Time management was huge because you have to like learn how to balance your schoolwork, your your practice times, tournaments on the weekend um teamwork is huge as well because i was on a soccer really? team and so like you have to build that camaraderie and learn how to play to the strengths of other people communication like the list i think goes on and on and that's why i always stress how important it is to get kids into sports at a young age because the sooner you start developing it i think just the better outcome in the long run because those are skills that Truly, you're, you're picking up at such a young age, but you can apply them throughout the rest of your life, even just, you know, to a career even afterwards. So well said, Bridgie. What did you say? It was soccer? You, yeah, uh, was I, I played soccer and a softball fast pitch. Okay. Awesome. Yeah. 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 She was good, Brian. He's my I uncle. was a proud uncle. She was good. She I get that it. vibe. No, please don't go <laughs> back, Bridgie. That's like, that's impressive. Yes. Um, but no, well said. Thank you. Precisely. Yeah. Yeah. yeah so I got a question for you now. We'll flip it back on to you. So you were a tennis player growing up. At what point did you decide like, okay, now I'm going to switch to pickleball because there was a little bit of tension between tennis players and pickleball players right when pickleball started getting really popular. Oh, I mean, I, and I think, I think there still is. I, um, <laughs> <laughs> I think that it's, there still is, but I, yeah, I'm, I'm pleased that, you know, it's, it's, it's softening, I think, um, uh, to say the least, uh, you know, I've had fa family members growing up, um, who would, you know, they were at the time older family members and at family gatherings and events that come from a big family, they would talk about pickleball. And I'd be the first to say like, what, like, don't talk to me about a pickleball. Like this, what, <laughs> what that, are you kidding me? Like I play tennis. And, um, so like, I, I was very much like aware of it. Like, talking 20 years ago when I'm a child I'm 35 like when I was like growing up um and was on a pickleball court before I mean like the paddles were wildly different um but it wasn't until really about two years ago that I live here in Austin so it's a hot spot of course for for pickleball tons of great uh um players here a lot of the top pros live here and so um I had, would have friends that say, hey, why don't you go, like, you know, come out and play some pickleball? Um, of course, being a dad and having a full-time job, like time is, is 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 limited. But the time that I would have, I would occasionally like get out there. And then one thing led to another. I'm like, okay, this is slowly growing on me. And then I got into a, um, a, uh, a project with a couple partners where we were making um, for a period of time online content, online lessons. I was the face of it because of the tennis background and um was having a blast with it i was like all in on pickleball and i mean any spare moment i had i was like just deep diving and studying the game watch youtube watching you know the ppa mlp all the things and um that project we we we, we pulled the plug beginning of the year and so it was kind of like hmm, like i'm at this crossroads now like do i want to stay in pickleball or do i want to like you know go on to another project like i and it was like it undoubtedly so i've enjoyed this so much i want to i feel like i'm just getting started in it but i don't know what i'm going to do so in the meantime what my focus is going to be with the little time that i have is creating like good content hopefully that's helpful for people that are just getting into the game how do i go from a beginner to a 4 -0? um and continue to kind of just uh build the local community here in Austin, you know, with, with some lessons and, and clinics. And, uh, you know, I would love to get into hosting some like weekend retreats of some sort, you know? Um, so like, the, like, I think like the, there's so many as, as, especially at the amateur level as pickleball is, I think just 
you know, we're still in the early innings. Um, I have a, I have a, a, a very long-term perspective um, with what I'm going to do with it. It's just not super crystal clear right now, but I don't think it has to be. I think it's just enjoy it. Be very open-minded, continue to do these types of things, meet incredible people in the space, yeah. give back to the game. And yeah, that's uh be, I'm content with that. Yeah. I mean, you are giving back to the game because your content that you're creating right now that, uh, you know, caught my eye on Instagram, you're, you're putting out some great videos, well-produced, informative, helpful, and fun, right? Some of the, some of the Hopefully, videos exactly. you do are, like, I'm yeah. trying to like even make it more so. Cause like at, at the end of the day, it's kind of like, um, you're entertaining too. Like, and that I'm still, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a baby with this social media stuff. So I'm like, you know, I'm a millennial. I don't know how this all works, but having some good people that could help, like it, you, I've realized the importance of that as well. And, but of course, from the content side to me, what's most important is the value you're giving and the information. So hopefully that's helpful for folks just getting into the game. Well, aren't you doing a project right now where you're taking somebody kind of off the street type of thing and you're trying to elevate them to what level? To a four oh or five oh, what are you what are you doing? Oh, you probably saw uh, there's a series that we're going to be doing for. Um, yes, we just actually filmed our first episode, like the intro on Friday. We'll be doing another one um, this evening where it's called Joe to Pro. So there's this uh, this uh, a friend of mine, and he's he's very big, you know, in, on the social media space. He reality TV. He's a realtor. He's like you know, kind of jack of all trades. Awesome guy. He was a former professional rugby player and uh, we're doing a series called Joe to pro where we see if Joe could go from day one to day 30 after like, you know, consistent training for a month, uh, you know, how, what the progression could look like and how far he can go sort of thing. So that's, uh, that's something that I'm looking forward to. It's just going to be super tight with both of our schedules, but we're going to make it happen. That's fun. Is his name actually Joe? No, 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 no. Oh, no. That would have been even better, right? Yeah. No, no, it's not. But it's it's a great one. It would have been. Yes, it would have been. But uh, it's I love the, his vision for it because it's it's like how do we make it uh, relatable? You know, for mm-hmm. for for yeah. just anyone out there, like you know. And I think so. I think he has his vision for what he wants to do. I mean, and I think he's going to do this in like various verticals, all different types of sports. So I'm just honor that he, you know, had asked me to do it for the pickleball um, space. And, you know, I know we'll have some fun with it. I'm curious, like, how do you take somebody from day one, like as a coach to get them to the highest level in 30 days, right? Because it, it you know, this oh. it's a process. Oh my gosh. It's 100%. So what do you do? How do you do that? A process. You know, I think it, it, there's so many different trains of thoughts and I don't think kind of like getting back to like the parenting thing. Like, I don't think there is a, a blueprint. I mean, other folks may think, yes, there is a blueprint and this is exactly how it's going to go. Um, I'm more so like, look, let's take it from day one, just take a holistic approach, look at your game, evaluate it, and then see, uh, let's work to your strengths and then the weaknesses. Let's make sure that we really focus in on those, but really doubling down on the strengths and playing to your strengths. Um, and how do we, structure you know this is more like more advanced but structure points where we're going to be um making sure that we're playing to those more often than not and the the, the areas of the, uh, the game and the uh, strokes that we want to protect like how do we limit those um and there are different ways that we can go about that and that's where the tennis playing at the, the higher level can help more so in pickleball and specifically on the single side the doubles, of course, very, very different, not as transferable, but there are different um, ways, mindsets and tactics that you could go about doing that as well. So but like from day one to day 30, um, it, what would look similar for a lot of folks is just like, OK, how are we going to structure, um, you know, our drill sessions, um, our games? Who are we going to compete against? We want to compete against different game styles. Uh, the drills always like, you know, when it comes to the pickleball world, very, very similar, you know, like 90% of the time folks need to practice the soft game, you know, the dinks, the various things, speed ups, how do you defend against a speed up? 
Um, the drops, arguably the most important shot, you know, in pickleball. How are we going to really get as many drops in as we possibly can? Various different techniques. You know, I like to say drops are basically dinks from further back for folks that are just beginning. Um, and then if we want to get a little more high level, we want to get a little more uh, spin on the ball. What is that technique going to look like? Where are we going to want to contact it? Where are we going to want to aim? Where's our positioning going to be after that? Um, it just really depends on kind of where that player is at that point in time. Um, but with the with the drilling, that's pretty much, you know, we see it all over the internet and with content, best warm-up routine. You know, everyone uses the same warm-up routine with, with you know, from start to finish. And so, um, you know, it's just really playing off of the student and seeing how committed they are. And uh, half the job is really just being a source of encouragement and being a positive voice. Because if you're being encouraging and positive, like they're, they, it's ultimately up to them um, how far they want to take it. And in my experience, when I'm just there in that corner, kind of like a parent showing up and being there, that gives them that little extra push for them to put in that extra effort, put in that extra drill session, et cetera. You well, know? I'm looking forward to following along and seeing how far Joe can get with his skills. <laughs> I can't um, wait to tell Joe that. He's going to love that. <laughs> <laughs> you do have a lot of great videos already out there. Um, and I'm just wondering what your creative process is like for finding a topic that you want to put out there. How, how does that look for you? Great question, Bridget. And it's constantly, constantly changing. Um, basically, what I've done more recently is... I'm probably teaching about three to four hours a week on average. Some weeks are more, some weeks, if I'm on the road a lot for work, it's, it's nothing, but I'll just keep a, basically a, uh, a notepad. And as I'm like teaching, um, these lessons, this lesson, this is kind of like what we're really focusing on here. I'll just take a note. And then that, that, and then, you know, once that list that, you know, after each week, you know, that becomes five different, five, six different talking, talking points. I will then make that like, then I'll write my scripts for um, the content for that week, essentially. And right now my goal is like to have a post like every other day. Um, sometimes it's more, sometimes it's less, but um, from the lessons that that's really the inspiration that I'll get for the, for the, for the content and then spending time on like, okay, as we all know, like the hooks, like hooks are so critical um, in terms of, uh, making quality content. So really, and that's where I have a, I'm very blessed to have a great, um, videographer and he does my editing where he's very experienced in the social media space. So like, it makes a good team where he could just, okay. Um, I, you know, I, I bring the pickleball, uh, experience and he brings the more of the social media. So he's doing all that type of stuff. And we just marry the two and, 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 and yeah. Um, but yeah, it wouldn't be possible if I didn't have someone because of the, you know, it's just, it's, it's a tremendous time commitment. Yeah. You know? Yeah. From your coaching experience, like what are some of the common tips that you provide that take people from the three Oh three, five level higher? Because there's certain, uh, there's certain uh, aspects of most players games that, you know, they can work on and, you know, make that jump fairly yeah. quickly and easily oh, if yeah. they just focused on it, right? What do, what do you see as a coach? There's so many, so many. Um, let's start with the first two shots, like the serve and the return. I think it's so not talked about enough how just getting depth, well, I'm not even talking power, just getting a little more depth on your serve and return could go so far. The amount of free points you can get. If you if the returner, as we know in pickleball, that's more of the advantage because you can get, could get to the kitchen quicker. Um, if you get good depth on that return, uh, you're going to maintain the advantage, you know? So I think like really being deliberate about putting an extra five to 10 minutes of practice session on your returns would go a very long way. Um, it could really get, go from that three, five to, you know, wherever you want to take it. Um, and then after the serve and return, you know, uh, you cannot hit enough third shot drops. Um, you know, being able to hit it, it's one thing to be able to hit it indoors, um, but being able to hit it in different elements outside and practicing it in different conditions and then practicing it not only uh, in practice, but doing it under pressure. If you're playing a local tournament, if you're playing a game, be it whatever, like so many folks I've seen like, oh, yeah, I could do it all day, Brian, in, in, in practice. And then I get to my game, get to my match, game, whatever, whatever you want to call it, 
I'm just wanting to drive it. I'm like, yeah, because you know, you're just, you know, you're not as confident or, uh, I'm like, it's never going to get better. We could do it all day in practice. If you're not doing it in the, in the real under pressure, we're not going to get anywhere. So just actually having the discipline to actually do it. Um, and then the most part I think is just the soft game. Like when you're in transition, instead of trying to bang it, like trying to hit a reset, really trying to be okay, softening it. And then actually getting into a rally, that's going to be more than 10 shots. Under the three, five, points aren't lasting more than maybe five, six shots. Um, and then once we get to the higher levels, like, you know, how are we going to just be comfortable dinking? And then when we're dinking, not hitting to the same spot twice. How are we going to be uh, lower level? I think there's a lot of, especially if you're coming from tennis, their footwork is wild. Because in tennis, you know, you're constantly on your feet. You're stepping into your volleys. In pickleball, like I want to say, you want to literally have a cup of water on your head and try to not let it fall. Like we want to be so still, less is more. And it's really just trusting your hands then, especially if you get into speed ups, um, you know, shrinking the kitchen, making sure we're trying to take more balls out of the air, looking for opportunities to speed up. All just it's it's it's, it's more of just um, learning more of the nuances, being a student of the game. Um you know, it's, it's a long, it's a good, you know, it's endless list really. Like it, that's the beauty of like anything at a high level, you know, you, there's always more and more and more, but softening the game. If I had to give one sentence, learn to just soften, soften, soften the game. Bridgie, I'm taking notes. <laughs> I was thinking, <laughs> I'm like, gosh, I need to get out there and start practicing. It's the <laughs> drilling that like yeah. I don't do, which I should be doing. <laughs> uh, I wish we were, if I was there, I'd be, let's get out there today. Um, uh, I'd love to. I actually had a friend who texted me just uh, the a couple of days ago, and I guess there was some pickleball event in Cali, and I guess uh, I think it was in SoCal, and mm -hmm. she said the next one is in Vegas in October. Is there some convention or something in Vegas in October? I don't know what one is specifically. I'll have to look into it, but there's always something, something going on, on here yeah. in Vegas and pickleball things will pop up without much notice either. So I'm sure. I'll have yeah. to look and find out. Yeah. But I'll see if I can find the name. Yeah. Um, so you're based in Austin actually, right? So mm -hmm. I'm wondering what is the pickleball scene like out in Austin? Cause here in Vegas, it's all outdoors mostly right now. I think there's like one or two indoor facilities, which makes it really hard to go out and practice because our weather right now is just atrocious you can't go outside without dying so in austin is it similar or do you have indoor and outdoor courts we it's similar in terms of the heat oh good gosh um <laughs> we've, we've we've actually had a, a slightly more mild summer this year than last which has been uh a pleasant surprise but yes there's both indoor and outdoor predominantly outdoor uh, but there was just a facility that was uh completed eight beautiful indoor courts north uh, just slightly north of the city, there's going to be another facility south that uh, is supposed to be world class. Um, uh, I think ten plus court sort of thing. Um, and the players yeah. you have down in Austin, I, I, I know, know, like I crazy mean, good. It's a, a, a very large amount of professional players here that are you know playing and training and and um, and then yes, a ton of great you know, players that are like in that 5-0 range who, you know, could play uh, like qualities of professional, you know, level events. Uh, and then the scene is just continuing to grow. You There is it because land is so tough to get, especially near downtown and it's so expensive here in Austin. Like it, courts are, there's just not enough courts still ultimately. And so like the open play of the public facilities is just insane and it's just like why wow, people will wait an hour to play a game of pickleball like and that's so awesome to see from for folks that like enthusiasts like us because it's like this is why i do what i do because this is just continuing to grow and so we we definitely need more public courts but there's more facilities going up left and right it's just some of these facilities that are beautiful some of them are like oh there's only four courts it's like well that's really not moving the needle um in terms of what we need for the amount of people that want to play you know so we need to open up some more courts in Austin. Yes, let's it do it. Like demand is there. We just need to figure yes. out how to, how to put that together. How is it in the Bay Area for uh, for you guys? You know, it's oh well, 
there are two indoor facilities that have opened up, or actually there's three, if you, the greater North uh, Bay Area. The okay. hub has two locations. There's one in San Jose, one in Alameda, and then our guest recently, Craneway Pavilion, has that absolutely gorgeous, gorgeous facility right on the bay. Um, and uh, you, you get to see the San Francisco skyline as you're playing pickleball. And they got a ping pong table. They got a restaurant. They got the bar. They got it's just lounging tables. It's just a really, really, really cool place. So I like going out to Greenway Pavilion if I want to play some indoor pickleball. pickleball. And then outdoor, there's just tons. There's just tons of birds. But it's it's very popular as you can imagine. And the oh. weather is usually, you know, pretty pretty mild you know it's yeah. not like i was just visiting bridgie and we tried to play you know at six o'clock at night and it was still 106 degrees or something like that and it was just we tried That's to tough. stick it out to the sun went down and by that time we were spent <laughs> so yeah, we, yeah. One. we canceled the other ones after that <laughs> yeah i mean you can only drink so much water and stuff and exactly. it's just it just yeah. beats you up. It just beats you up. And then, you know, one of the things that I found in myself when I'm in that kind of heat playing, I just lose concentration. I lose, yeah. I lose focus. It was tough for me to kind of, you know, stay in it. Like, you know, from a coach's point of view, do you help people like focus and like stay in matches and stay in games and try not to get too distracted or, you know, like me got uh, distracted by the heat? Yeah, no, that's a good. That's a great question. Really, haven't. Uh, you, you're, that's a good thing for me to maybe think a little bit more on in, in terms of how to just be better for students. I haven't really thought of of that. It really has been brought up like, oh, I struggle with focus, but I need maybe need to ask a little bit more because, yeah, I mean, even myself, like it's 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 so so important in pickleball because the game is so fast paced, and if you kind of lose focus for a minute, that could change everything you know, with momentum and, um, it's not as forgiving as in tennis where you could kind of maybe claw back a little bit. Um, pickleball, if you get down and that's, I mean, it could be cost you the game. So, um, you know, I think, uh, but what is transferable and universal in terms of like probably all sports for even for softball and soccer, Bridgie, like just how do you use your breath and, um, focus on the here and now? you know, being, staying present again here and now it's, I, I would always, for those viewers watching, you're probably like rolling your eyes. Cause I would hear that all the time as a tennis player. Like, I'm like, stop it. It's so much harder that, you know, it's easier said than done staying here and now, how do you do that? You know, but there's, if there's, and, and again, like anything, if it's worth doing, it's not easy. And I really think it takes a lot of practice. Like the mental strength is a muscle just can't be seen like, like, like a physical muscle and arguably needs to be worked on even more. And so like, is that visualization? Is that, uh, I remember I used to have a rubber band on my wrist when I would play and I would flick it after a point, like, okay, so whatever thoughts are coming into the head, literally just stop, go to my towel, um, passes in the past. How are we going to show up for this point? Regardless of whatever the emotion is at that moment, completely here and now quiet the mind. Um, I mean, there's thousands of books out there, you know, on, on all of this. Like, I, I mean, it's for a reason because it is that important. And um, I think, uh, you know, you could go down a rabbit hole for sure. Easier said than done. But I think uh, those who could keep it simple oftentimes have more success and like just have less thoughts because analysis by paralysis is a real thing. And if there's anything I would share with the students is whatever you're working in, in, on, on the practice court. Uh, trust the work that was put in and then just let it go once you hit the game, because that is not the time to be thinking or analyzing, just go the, trust the work that was put in and go have fun and, and let it, let it rip, you know, let her rip. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> let her rip. Well, Brian, you've provided us with so many great pieces of advice just in this one conversation, but there's so much more that you have available to everybody on your Instagram page. Can you share with our listeners what your Instagram handle is? Yep, it's Pickleball Bryant, so super easy to find. Um, and yeah, no, just very grateful, guys, to to be on here. This was a blast. Um, look forward to meeting you guys in, in flesh, uh, in person sooner rather than later. And uh, yeah, what I do is is strictly out of passion for the game. So like, 
any any if you guys have any questions or need support in any way i, I truly mean it feel free to reach out um that's why i'm here well you know the tradition Let's we go. gotta wish oh. uh bryant all the success in the world and Let's both ways around the horn here being guys. a parent to getting together to all your coaching and all the content here's yes. to you bryant cheers, cheers. guys Thank you so much for joining us today. Thanks, guys. Have a good day. You, you too. too. And for all of you listening, thank you for joining us, where Bridgie and I will continue to share our pickleball journey. And a special thanks to Pickleball Bryant. Go to find him on, on uh, Instagram, Pickleball Bryant. Uh, great content. Uh, like I said earlier, a lot of fun. And you are going to learn something. If you watch his videos, you will learn. Uh, please support this show by subscribing. We promise to have more amazing guests just like Brian in future episodes of Third Shot. Let's continue. Share our enjoyment for the game and grow this pickleball community. That's what Brian's doing. That's what Bridgie and I are doing. Let's all get together and grow it. See you next time on Third Shot Podcast. <laughs>